All right, welcome back everybody. And today I'm going to be doing a video on one specific problem that I've actually already covered in another video, namely the video where I integrated um, the function sine of x over x using complex analysis. Um, I want to redo one specific section of that video where I took the integral over gamma of f of z dz um, just because in that video I wasn't quite rigorous in what I was doing and today I just want to do a video for you guys who want the full complete proof for this specific integral right here. So what we wanted to do was calculate the integral over gamma of f of z dz over gamma where gamma we defined it to be a semicircle over an arc of radius r in the upper half of the complex plane, so just this path right here. And we wanted to show that if we take the limit as our r approaches infinity, this integral vanishes off to zero. So how do we get started right here? Let's first of all take the absolute value of just this integral right here. So if we take the absolute value of this thing, we want to find some kinds of upper bounds for this thing. So we can start by, well, parameterizing this path of gamma, so this is still equal to the integral. Now we want to set up a parameterization, so the easiest way to do this is just to, well, use this definition of z right here, because we know that for all z on this path, it can be expressed as r times e to the i theta. So if we differentiate both sides, dz is now equal to, well, just using some chain rule right here, it's going to be equal to i times r e to the i theta d theta and notice theta is going from 0 to pi so now we have the integral growing from 0 to pi and now we have this function f of z right here which is e to the i z over z so we just substitute z for this thing right here so this function f of z becomes e to the i now z is exactly r times e to the i theta and then we're going to divide this by r times e to the i theta because that's our z and then our dz right here, our dz we just wrote it down right here, that's i times r e to the i theta d theta and that's still inside of an absolute value like so and you see the nice thing is this factor and this factor will cancel each other out leaving us with just the integral, actually the absolute value of the integral from 0 to pi of i times e to the i r e to the i theta d theta okay very nice and now what's the nice thing about this integral we have a real variable right here theta is a real variable because it's ranging on this interval right here from zero to pi which means we can use a specific integral inequality which says that if you take the absolute value of this integral right here of a real variable it's less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value. So the integral from zero to pi of the absolute value of this thing. So we have the absolute value of i times e to the i r e to the i theta. Um, absolute value d theta like so. Okay, and now notice that we have a product right here, which means we can split the absolute values up a little bit. So this is absolute value of i times absolute value of this exponential thing. And absolute value of i, that's exactly one. And what we can do some work with this exponential term right here because notice that I'll just put it over here for now e to the i r times e to the i theta we can split up this inner exponential term right here using Euler's formula so this is equal to e to the i and r and then cosine of theta plus i times the sine of theta and we can do some distribution in this exponent right here. So this is equal to e times i r cosine theta. And notice i times i, that's negative one. So we have minus r times the sine of theta. And now we have basically an addition of two things in the argument of the exponential function right here. So we can split the exponential up to be an e to the i r cosine of theta and then e to the minus r sine of theta like so. And now we can substitute this thing into here. And notice one cool thing will happen when we do that. So this is now the integral from zero to pi. This i is gone, so now we're left with the absolute value of this thing right here. And I'm actually going to split the absolute value up between these products. So now we have e to the i r cosine of theta and another absolute value, e to the minus r sine of theta like so d theta okay and now notice one cool thing right here theta is a real variable which means cosine of theta is also real 
r is also real which means we have e to the i times some real number right here and the absolute value of that that's exactly one and how about over here we have e to the minus r times some real number well the exponential of some real thing is always positive so we don't even need absolute values right here so this integral just turns into the integral from zero to pi of e to the minus r times the sine of theta d theta that's quite nice. I've done quite a bit of simplification right there. All right, so if we trace back the inequalities a little bit, notice that we had an inequality right here. So what we basically said was that this integral we started off with right here is less than or equal to this integral. So if we erase some of the stuff in the middle right here that we don't really need anymore, what we've found out so far that is that this integral, the absolute value of the integral of a gamma is less than or equal to the integral from zero to pi of e to the minus r times the sine of theta d theta like so and now we could try to integrate this function right here but that would be a little bit difficult another way we could go around it is by estimating this integral even further and the way we're going to start is by looking at the sine of theta right here notice that sine of theta on the interval from zero to pi looks just like a bump so we're going from zero to pi and the nice thing about this function is that it's symmetric across uh, pi over 2 like so. So you see here we're integrating from 0 to pi and we have this sine function right, right here and if you integrate sine from 0 to pi that's actually the same thing as going from 0 to 2 pi so just finding this little area right here and then multiplying the result by 2 and you may say well the sine function is composed within this exponential function right here but that doesn't matter the symmetry still holds and if you actually try to graph this out I think you get some weird curve that looks like this so kind of some kind of u shape and you see that is still symmetric across pi over 2 so what we can do now is say that this integral is nothing other than the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of the same function so e to the minus r sine of theta d theta but we have to double it because this integral only calculates half of this area and we want the whole area so we have to double it like so all right so that's pretty cool we've i guess we've halved the interval right here but why did we do that it's because we want to bound our function sine of theta right here so if we take a look at the function sine of theta on the interval from zero to two pi looks something like this so um this is pi on two right here actually i'll write the coordinates this is pi on two comma one so we're going from 0 to pi over 2, and that's our function sine of theta right here. So this is the theta axis. And well, what we want to do is we want to find some kind of function in here that's greater than what we have already. And in doing so, we'll find an upper bound for our integral. So we're going to be taking a look at two graphs right here. We're going to be taking a look at sine of theta, which is in here, as well as a negative exponential. So a decreasing exponential right here, which is basically what we have. So this is e to the minus r is a positive number so it doesn't really change things we'll just take a look at e to the minus x for example and notice one thing on this function right here if we pick some point a right here that means that the output of our function if we plug it in is e to the minus a and let's say we pick some point b right here so this is point b uh, a is less than or equal to b we're going to our output will be e to the minus b and notice one thing if a is less than or equal to b e to the minus a is greater than or equal to e to the minus b and why is this fact useful right here well remember we wanted to find some kind of upper bound for our integral which means an upper bound for our exponential function right here so if we can show that our exponential right here let's say this current e to the minus r sine theta is our e of minus b if we can find some e to the minus to a that's bigger than e to the minus b, then we've found an upper bounds for our integral. And what are the conditions for this to hold? Well, if e to the minus r sine theta, if that's our e to the minus b right here, then in order to find our e to the minus a, we need some kind of a that's smaller than b, which means that we need some kind of function right here that's smaller than sine of theta on the interval from zero to pi on two. So let me just recap that right there. If we can find a function that's smaller than sine of theta on this interval right here that means if we exponentiate that function it's going to be greater than what we have over here so the so i guess the best function to use in this case that's less than sine of theta is just the straight line that connects the origin to this point here that's an ugly line but 
Hope you guys get the idea. So we have this line right here. And notice that this line is less than or equal to sine of theta on this interval. And this line is pretty easy to find its equation. It's just rise over run. So 1 over pi and 2, which is um, 2 and pi theta. So if this, if this is the y-axis, for example, this is y equals 2 over pi theta. So I'll just put it right over here. So for all theta on the interval 0 to pi on 2, we have that our 2 on pi theta is less than or equal to sine of theta. And why is that useful? Or well, using this little relationship right here, if we have some kind of a that's smaller than b, then e to the minus 2 over pi theta is greater than or equal to e to the minus e to the minus um, sine of theta. And of course, we have this r right here, which is positive. So we'll just chuck it in there, won't really change anything. The inequality will still hold. So I'll just chuck a minus r inside of there. All right, very nice. So basically what we've found is an upper bounds for our function right here, which means an upper bounds for our integral. So we don't really need all of this stuff anymore. We just showed that this function right here is greater than what we currently have over here. So in fact, this integral is less than or equal to two times the integral from zero to pi over two of e to the minus r and then we have 2 over pi theta instead. So I'll, I guess I'll write it as um, minus 2r over pi times theta, d theta like so. Okay, and now what can we do? We can integrate this quite easily because this is hard to integrate. And since now we have just a linear function, now exponential right here, it's just some calculus one integral you can do quite easily. So what do we have right here? Well, we still have this two. And if we integrate the exponential function, well, we're still gonna get the exponential function. But when you differentiate this, you're gonna get this extra factor in front of the theta on the outside. So in order to kind of cancel that out, we need to divide by this factor. So this is just some reverse chain rule stuff. So divide by minus two r over pi. And evaluating this from, um, let's see, zero to two pi over two. Um, let's clean things up a little bit over here. So these twos will cancel out. This pi will flip up to the top, leaving us with minus pi over r. And now just plugging the values right here. If we plug pi over two into here, let's just write everything out actually. So we have e to the minus, 2r over pi. If theta is pi over 2, then we're just going to get pi over 2 right here. And if we plug in 0, then e to the 0 is just 1. So we just have minus 1 like so. And now we just need to clean things up a little bit. This is equal to minus pi over r. And well, these pi's will cancel out, these 2's will cancel out, leaving us with e to the minus r minus 1, like so. All right, so what exactly did we just show right here? We just showed that, well, this integral is equal to this result right here. But remember, all these integrals are greater than the integral we originally had. So this integral is bounded above by what we have right here. So what can we say right here? We can say that the integral over gamma, or the absolute value of the integral over gamma, the absolute value integral over gamma of f of z dz, it's bounded above by this function right here. So minus pi over r times e to the minus r minus one like so. All right, and why is this useful right here? Well, notice when you take the limit as our r approaches infinity, this thing actually goes to zero. So let's take the limit on both sides. So if we take the limit as r approaches infinity on the absolute value of gamma, it's less than or equal to the limit as our r approaches infinity of minus pi over r times e to the minus r minus one. All right, and notice as I said before, this limit goes to zero. That's quite easy to show because this r, as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it's going to kill off everything. Not only that, but we have this decreasing exponential. So as r gets bigger, this exponential just pulls everything down to zero as well. So we have no problems with like indeterminate forms or anything there. So this is just going to go to zero in the limit. So that means that the limit, as our r approaches infinity of the absolute value, the integral over gamma is less than or equal to zero. But notice one thing right here, the absolute value function is always positive, which means that the only way for a positive number to be less than or equal to zero is if that positive number is equal to zero itself. So we'll just conclude things over here. This statement implies that the limit as r approaches infinity 
on the absolute value of gamma is equal to zero because this thing can't be negative. Okay, then what does this tell us right here? Well, the absolute, if the absolute value of anything is zero, then that thing itself is equal to zero. So that means that the limits as our r approaches infinity on the integral over gamma of f of z dz is, well, equal to zero. And that is pretty much it for our proof right there. So hopefully that was a, a bit more of a complete proof of everything right here. But yeah, if you want to watch the original video, link will be up here or in the description. Hope you guys found this useful. And until next time, have a wonderful day and I'll see everyone later. Bye bye.